in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Eric with American Business Systems. We want to welcome you this afternoon. We're going to talk about Obamacare today and how that is impacting uh, the medical billing field and whether this is a field you ought to be in uh, with a the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, or not. Again, my name is Eric. I'm the Research and Development Director here at American Business Systems, and I'm certainly going to tell you we've got a lot of stuff in development so far. But as always, for those that have uh, attended uh, webinars in the past, we want to make sure that you're hearing us okay. And so certainly we want to have you click on that little icon of the hand there, and that way you can raise your hand there and so we can see. So we've got Ann, uh, Benji, looks like Jacqueline, uh, Paul, Rosemary, uh, let's see who else we rich. God, uh, Evelyn, good to have everybody here. Bob. So, folks, thank you for indicating to us that our voices are coming through. Now, again, we want to hear from you. We were, have just been reading some of our uh, uh, some information, some feedback from everybody, and uh, someone said once that we don't take enough questions. So, we need to hear from you. So. <laughs> We want you to type in your questions. So we're pointing to this box right there so you can type in your questions anytime during the webinar. So be sure just to go ahead and give us a quick shout through that and uh, we will be happy to help you out there. Well, we want to tell you about American Business Systems and who we are. We are the nation's largest network of independent medical billers, helping people just like you for the last 20 years. Uh, folks that you see here on the screen, whether they're families, single guys, it uh, doesn't matter, and uh, so we certainly can help you out and uh, help each and every one of you to get your business started. Folks, we're showing a picture of our web uh, our website here, and uh, we've got some pointed arrows there so you can get to our virtual brochure. This is where, folks, you can really get into a lot of information. This is probably the most packed uh, portion of all of our information that we have on American business systems, whether we're talking about the opportunity, about getting clients, the training aspect of it, uh, support, whatever it might be, this is where you can certainly find it. And one of the things that you can certainly find there is our award-winning software, whether it's iClaim or EMRX. This is the driver. This is the differentiator why people would use you, why doctors would use you. I mean, folks, you can go back and listen to our webinars from past history. Uh, where Patrick and I have actually done webinars on why would a doctor use you. Go back and watch those, those webinars, especially on uh, our, our software here. We are part of the Better Business Bureau as an A-plus rating there. You can see there uh, you want to be able to just check us out. Just go to the Better Business Bureau of Fort Worth or the Tarrant County area. Type in American Business Systems, and you'll see there our A-plus rating. All right. For those that want to come by and visit with us, you're more than welcome to come by and visit with us. We're located here at 5751 Kroger Drive. This is our headquarters just north of Fort Worth, flying to the DFW area, and then we'll figure out some way to pick you up and bring you back over to the office. Our next class is just about five days away from today, which means that it's going to start on Monday. Uh, so I think we have a few seats that we're just maybe uh, being able to be, get filled there. But if you just can't make it to this May class, our next one is after July the 4th weekend. It starts there at July the 7th through July the 11th. So please mark your calendars down for that upcoming training workshop that we have coming up. Let me introduce you to Patrick Phillips. He is our CEO and founder of American Business Systems. As uh, we have put, said so many times in the past, he is an author of these two books here that you can see here, How to Reprogram Yourself for Success, and the one, Cash Crunch to Cash Flow. That is the one that will help you with your marketing, and we go over that pretty extensively. He's also on the editorial board of Billing and Coding Advantage Magazine, The Bright Future of Medical Billing, as you can see right there. Uh, it was one of the articles he wrote just last year. We're actually going to go over another one of the articles uh, attaining to the Affordable Care Act through the webinar presentation today. So pay attention to that. And really, without any further ado, let me bring Patrick on because we do have a ton of information we want to go through today. So Patrick, uh, I see your empty chair. I hope there we are. 
<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just running just a tad late there. Okay, well, thanks, Eric. Uh, this is going to be a good one because people ask a lot of questions about this, don't they? They do. Uh, you know, the ACA, Affordable Care Act, uh, Obamacare, whatever we want to end up calling it, there is no doubt that uh, it, this is making great business opportunities for uh, those that are getting into the medical building business. Yeah, who would have thought uh, that that we would think of Obamacare as a business opportunity? And of course, it is for people who are looking into this field. Uh, I don't know about uh, for doctors, it's not much of a business opportunity. They're kind of struggling right now with some of it, but uh, we'll get into that. And, and the reasons why it's a good, uh, good field, we think, uh, for people to get into as a business. If you're thinking about getting into a business, folks, this is uh, at least worth uh, a look at. Uh, sure. And it really boils down to this question, doesn't it, Eric? I mean, it's it's what people are wondering how you know how does that affect the future of medical billing companies? So if they started a business like this, you know, would they have a future or would they be out of business here in a year or two? <laughs> that that's correct. And I think one of the things that I know you're going to be leading into here is we have uh, what we would consider to be. Uh, we've talked about this in the past, as you you got up here on the screen that. In, in, in essence, doctors are running two businesses, if we really think about that, because the billing side of everything has become so specialized because of things like Obamacare or the ACA or the compliance issues having to deal with Medicare, this and the other. Right. Really, where doctors want to be is right where you've got the picture there, you know, treating patients. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what they uh, were trained to do. That's what they spent money to do. That's what they enjoy doing is that face-to-face uh, -face patient encounter where they help that patient uh, get well and hopefully stay well, and uh, and yet they're forced to do some other stuff, aren't they? Yeah, it, it, and it's on this side of the business that gets so convoluted because there are so many different things that they have to keep up with. Again, we just mentioned one about the just the compliance issues with Medicare, and that has to do with HIPAA. That's that whole Privacy Act thing for the patients. And, uh, boy, I'm telling you, it, it, they're really cracking down on that, and that falls in that lap of medical billing because that's where all the patient records are kind of out on the table. And so it, it can be a little scary for these doctors if, uh, if they really start to think about it. Well, the one question we can ask people when they come to our training class, you've heard me ask this question to the class. Uh, you know, those of you who've worked in a, or around a doctor's office or know somebody who does, uh, tell me what your opinion is of doctors as businessmen, business owners, business women. And it's always very negative, isn't it? They, they don't like that side of their business at all, the business side of it. Right. They, they, yeah. don't, they enjoy the, the clinical side, but not necessarily the uh, paperwork that's involved in. Because, look, they see a patient, uh, they, they file a, a, an insurance claim. They have to to get paid, but they don't really necessarily like that. And that's why they hire people usually in their office uh, to do that for them. Or they have outsourced it like they do to our licensees. So again, for the for those that are on the call today and those that will be listening in on this, understand truly the doctors, if they're doing billing in their own office, they're running two separate things. But now moving over to this Obamacare, uh, I don't think this is going away anytime soon, Patrick. Uh, we've already talked about it's called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. It's a, it's a uh, law. It's a law. It's been passed. It is a law. It's here. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and whether we whether we like it, aspects of it or not, it doesn't matter uh, what your political views are on it. It is here, and now we have to deal with it, and the doctors have to deal with it. So right. what we've tried to figure out is how does that apply to this business of doing the billing for the doctors? How will it affect uh, the people who get into this business? By the way, it's also known as the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. That's the literal name of the law. But, uh, hey, even the president himself used Obamacare and uses that term uh, because he's kind of proud of it. So. Uh, we just sure. use that as a shortcut way of talking about the the PP and ACA. <laughs> yeah, and, and and again, I think this presents actually for those that are real entrepreneurs, kind of gives us a, a a way of really being able to look at things and can we take advantage of it? And I think that's what we're going to try to cover today. Yeah, because it boils down to this. Uh, we don't know what the number is. I've heard different numbers, but 30 million uh, newly insured Americans are supposed to move into the system because right. of Obamacare. 32% uh, will gain coverage from Medicaid, 45% from individual exchanges, and then 23% from their employers. However, that actually works out in reality, 
uh, once it's fully implemented. Uh, the point is, there's a lot of a uh, lot of patients out there, and it's and it's a big opportunity for people who want to get in there and help the doctor see more patients, do the things they like to do, and yet help the doctor get paid. Yeah, and and like you've got here on the screen, uh, this guy Martin uh, Willoughby, who is an entrepreneur consultant. I mean, this is what he does, and he just basically has said here, uh, I love it. Uh, regardless of what happens with Obamacare, it doesn't matter if it crashes whether it explodes, whether it goes into full force, uh, I hope you will seize on this opportunity. And that's what we're going to be talking about today because that's where entrepreneurs will really take advantage of these types of opportunities. And this is a great one, Patrick, because again, medicine's not going anywhere. Uh, right. And he sees it as an opportunity for entrepreneurs. Uh, and and the, the great thing is, oh, I think I went backwards there one slide, uh, it, it, it's because there's another institute called the Clayton Christian Institute, and it says that it's all about disruption. Uh, in today's uh, business world, disruption always means that things are going to change. And when things change, that brings about opportunities. Well, guess what? Entrepreneurs, people who start their own business, they're all about that because they know that the money is where the change is, the disruption. The, getting involved in a business that has to do with something that is changing uh, is what makes them entrepreneurs. Exactly, and 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 this is one of those areas. I'm actually taking notes down here uh, to talk about certain things as we go through today, uh, because Patrick, this is one of those areas that you've even mentioned on previous webinars about disruption, and we talked about. I think we even talked about it last week, whenever there were people uh, that started businesses when there was a recession, and right. when there were depressions here in America. So yeah, that, yeah. that's that's what this is all about. Yeah, Ford Motor Company, AT&T, uh, Toll House Cookies, I mean, uh, Whataburger, all of those companies were started in a down economy. So it's a great time, folks, to start uh, your own business. If you're wondering how this is affecting this industry, look at this one. Here's another quote from the same institute. Throughout history, disruptive innovations have repeatedly and often predictably transformed entire industries through the introduction of affordable and accessible products and services you're going to be able to offer affordable services to the doctor that will save the doctor a ton of money. Uh, Eric, on average, we, we can probably cut a doctor's costs for doing billing uh, if he's doing it in-house with his own staff. Uh, we can cut that in half, can't we? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, and then one more quote from them. In response from their blog post, it's absolutely indisputable that Obamacare has introduced a level of change and chaos that will have lots of winners and losers. Speaking for myself only, I think this has helped entrepreneurs. When things were in stasis, uh, they there was little motivation for providers to work with startups. Uh, stasis, meaning uh, static, no, no change whatsoever. And there was little motivation for providers to work with startup companies like our licensees. Folks, you will be a startup company. We will put you in business no matter what your background is with no background in the medical field whatsoever. We have people being successful in this business. And, and this is why. Uh, it's all about uh, helping people get motivated to go out there and do something in today's economy. That's right. And, and Patrick, we've got, we got questions coming in and there are some questions I'm, I'm gonna interject throughout our presentation today. There are gonna be some that have come in that we're gonna wait till the end. So. Vernon, we're going we're gonna to answer your question here towards the end, but I want to talk real quickly about Bob's question here. He says, I'm not a good salesperson, and I really hate talking to people. <laughs> Can a person still make it in this business uh, if they freeze when they're talking to other people? Uh, how can you... How can you get and keep accounts without visiting doctor's offices? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm kind of giggling as I'm reading that because he's being very honest, right? I mean, let's exactly. face it. This is the scariest part of not just this business, but any business. I mean, I've started several businesses in the past. And I can tell you every one of them, the hardest part is facing people uh, and, and uh, showing them the need for your product or service. Well, guess what, folks? When we have salespeople, sales type people in our class, I tell them, you must forget everything you've been trained about sales because in our industry, it's a, not a matter of selling the doctor on anything. It's a matter of educating them on the value of what you have. Look, Eric, you're the one that taught me this. 
if I handed you a $1 bill, uh, would you give me a $5 bill? No, but if I could show you that that $100 bill was a very unique $100, uh, uh, $1 bill that was worth $100, of course you'd give me five, uh, $5 for it, right? So it's all about value. We show the doctor the value of us taking over that part of their practice and letting them focus on the part of their practice that makes them money. So, uh, Bob, the answer is, we, well, here's some of the people I'm going to show you right now that without any background in sales whatsoever have built their business. This is Benjamin Ishkahoff in New York. Uh, came here only about 12 or 13 years ago as an immigrant, not speaking a word of English from Russia. And him and his partner built this business now and have two offices in Manhattan, 30 employees, and over 200 practices. That could mean they have uh, 500 doctors that they're doing right. billing for. Uh, with no background in sales uh, whatsoever, uh, he was an attorney and his partner was in uh, gold and jewelry type of stuff. So uh, we have numbers of these on our blog, by the way. If you go to our website under, I think it's under the news tab, isn't it, Eric? News right. and then blog. Guys, you can go backward in time on that blog and see all these interviews with people like Joe and Jennifer Catano in North Carolina. They have seven practices they do the billing for. They're making a six-figure income working from home. And I think they even put a couple, a couple of their teenage boys there to work as well. Tracy <laughs> Clark in Kentucky. She just recently signed a sleep center within four months uh, of getting out of our training that bills $300,000 a month. Eric, I think she's charging about 5.5% uh, on that. So you do the math on that. That's, that's a lot of money for her each month, that's, right? That's a good, good <laughs> chunk of money. There's no doubt. I visited uh, with Janet Malinowski, one of our licensees who came through probably five years ago. She's up in Ohio. Uh, she does billing for 23 practices, 2,500 square foot office space. I took this picture of her and her staff. That's her uh, fourth one from the right. Seven full-time employees. So folks, you get to the point where you can bill this as big as you want to or as small as you want to. So I thought I'd just throw those in to let you know, folks, that if you want to talk to some of those people, we've got... Uh, what now, Eric? Maybe two dozen people that have agreed to oh, take some yeah. phone calls for us across the country. Real people. Absolutely. Yeah, some of them with offices like uh, Janet that if you told her ahead of time, she'd let you come visit her. All right, so we're, let's get back to the, the subject about how Obamacare will affect the medical billing industry. I mean, this is um, a, an article that you found here. Yeah, it's just, just, as, uh, just as recent as it gets. Uh, this uh, is a website out there, by the way, that's uh, actually uh, an advocate for patients, helping them to figure out whether their bills are accurate from a hospital, for example. But she wrote this great article on how Obamacare will affect the medical bill industry. Let me just show you a couple of quotes from it. I've highlighted this last paragraph here. Uh, some are concerned. Uh, with position cuts in the industry, meaning people who work inside the doctor's office uh, as medical billers. But still more people, she says, are fairly certain that not only will the current positions remain, but we will see a surge of available medical billing jobs due to the need for new billing expertise to comply not only with Obamacare regulations, but also to comply with the eventual rollout of the new ICD-10 medical billing codes. Eric, everybody's heard about those codes. They were supposed to have gone into effect when? Uh, this October, October, right? They were going to be going in, uh, into effect October uh, this year of 2014, but it's been postponed. Uh, it, it went through its voting uh, in the House of Representatives and Congress, and, uh, and so and the president signed off on it, and so that got moved from October 2014 to 2015. Well, yeah. what does that do? It, it pre presents another disruption. In, in, in the whole medical billing field. That's right. Doctors were panicking, weren't they? Uh, trying to get they ready were. for their new codes here in this October. And so when it was pushed off another year, they all kind of took a, a, a breath. Well, I can tell you what will happen. Between now and next October uh, in 2015, the doctors will still be dragging their feet. They won't be ready for it. And they'll still worry about finding people who know enough about those codes. Because, Eric, don't they like like there are like 10 times as many codes in the ICD-10 as there is now in the uh, current codes? Yeah, and, and it kind of goes along with a, a, a question I can see here from Keith, and Keith's asking the question about, uh, you know, the, the codes. And, you know, as a medical billing company, what really does a, the billing company do? Do they have to be involved with this coding? I mean, if we're going from one set of codes to, to a new set of codes, how's that going to affect me as a new ABS licensee? 
Well, uh, here's the great part is you don't have to know anything about the codes. All these courses you see out there at local colleges and online for learning how to do medical coding, folks, that would be if you had if you were going to go into a hospital, for example, and all you did all day long was figure out codes and make sure that the codes were correct for all the doctors in the hospital. Uh, most doctors can't afford a medical coder, so it's most, mostly hospitals that use those. Individual doctors have to figure that out on their own. Well, guess what? You don't have to because our system has all the codes in there. Uh, we'll right. show you a picture of that here in just a little while, too. There you go. Here's another quote right. from that same article. She goes on to say uh, the good things about how Obamacare will affect this industry. More doctors will outsource. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna be outsourcing. Look, she says at the bottom there, plenty of already publicized frustration with new billing procedures is likely to entice the doctors who previously rejected the idea of outsourcing their billing to give it a second thought. Why? Because the Affordable Care Act appears to be forcing these providers to bill on a trial and error basis billing for quality over quantity. Uh, Eric, I, you know, I was just reading a book that I have here on my shelf called Obamacare Survival Guide. It's for uh, individuals and doctors. And look, it even says in here that the surge of doctors' anger is understandable at Obamacare because it reduces their earning potential uh, by, for instance, putting new restraints on payment rates in Medicare. So the doctors are upset. That's why they're thinking very seriously now, maybe I need to turn this over to somebody who's a specialist in this. I think I lost Eric. I think I did. Okay, well, anyway, I'm going to go on assuming that people are listening to me. Are you listening to me, folks? Uh, raise your hand out there if you are listening to me. Let me see if this, some hands are raised. Maybe my volume went completely down too. Okay, I see a few hands going up. Thank you. All right, I guess it's working now. Look at that last paragraph. This is a confusing rule to many of these providers, and they are beginning to feel as if their reimbursements will be co compromised because of this. Who better to handle the grunt work than a trained professional? Folks, this is very high-paying grunt work. I tell people, you are a very highly paid data entry person in this industry. Uh, you can make, most of our licensees say they're making $80, $90 an hour doing this medical billing or working from their home. So uh, I'm going to move right on here with another slide. One last quote from this lady's article. She says, more people will be insured. We know that. And she says in this highlighted area, since more claims will need to be processed, more trained staff will likely be in demand. So while the Affordable Care Act supposedly focuses on quality over quantity, quantity will be an issue when these once denied individuals begin pouring through the doors. Folks, the doctors are going to be overwhelmed and they need all the help they can get. And we're the ones that can help them. Let's see if I can see some more uh, signs, uh, uh, questions here from people. Now, folks, some of you are addressing questions that really have to do with uh, some individual situations that you have, uh, not being able to come up with the funds, for example. That's something you have to discuss with your ABS business consultant. So get back to the person who sent you this email and tell them and ask them those specific questions that you're asking about those things. Um, here's Bob. He says, my wife and I are in our mid-60s. Does age matter when starting a business such as this? Bob, I can't tell you how many people your age, lots of folks in their 60s, and yes, even some 70s have come through our training and been very successful in this business. It does not matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your religion, your age, your ethnic background, or your race, nothing matters because we've got people in all segments of life that have been successful. Now, this is why... And I'm going to show you at the end of this webinar why I came up with an unheard of guarantee, a 100% money back guarantee. It's for questions like this. When you're not sure about what you're uh, getting into, how do you get out of it? How do you get all your money back? I'm going to show you how we do that at the very end of this. Eric, you back? I, I am. I, I've had to actually switch my mic over to, I believe, my internal microphone. So Weird. That okay. was very weird. We were having a little trouble with our microphones Earlier. before we even got started there. Yeah, on the test run. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even glance over to see if you were on the, uh, I've got my laptop here. I, I guess I could have seen you on the video. Were you waving at me or something? <laughs> I, I was. Maybe everybody else saw me too. <laughs> That's All okay. The perils of having a live webinar. Okay. Um, Absolutely. Now here's another article I just found. Uh, you can see it's dated April 29th. Uh, that's on the over, Obamacare red tape is overwhelming the doctors. Now, I've, I've got it zoomed out here on that last paragraph so you can read it. Today, with the passage of Obamacare, the demands for data from doctors have met 
had metas, metastasized, well, they'd gotten bigger, like a red tape <laughs> cancer, according to the story. <laughs> Metastasize. Met metastasize, thank you. According to the story, <laughs> medical practices have been forced to install expensive, complex software systems that sharply reduce time for patients. Now, Eric, isn't that great that the doctors are forced to look at all this different software out there and try to decide, do I want to bring it in-house or do I want to just turn it over to somebody who has a great system on yeah. that? And I think that's probably one of the other biggest questions that a lot of brand new licensees or even people that are getting into this business, don't the doctors already have software? Folks, they are trying to ditch their expensive software mm -hmm. and you will be able to pro pro provide them, <laughs> as we've shown earlier with iClaim and EMRX, a, a, a very competitive and award-winning software that can help them reduce these times. Uh, and get in with those patients and, and then get their, get those claims paid. That's the biggest thing. That's that's all they care about. Well, they care about seeing patients and getting paid for seeing patients. Uh, exactly. By the way, look, this says the last part of that, sharply reduce the time for patients. It is a problem that doctors are not going to have enough time to see patients. And so they're worried about that and focusing on the business side, trying to get paid for seeing those patients. So how... I put this question in this chart up because I want people to grasp how the ACA will affect the revenue cycle. Now, remember, ACA is Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. How will it affect the revenue cycle? In a doctor's office, they talk about the revenue cycle, meaning all of the money that comes in from the insurance companies, the government agencies, and the patients. Well, here's how it affects it. First of all, we just talked about the doctors are going to be seeing more patients. See up here at the top? Right. More patients leads to more visits from those patients, right? 30 million new uninsured Americans coming in. More claims will be generated. That will mean more revenue for the doctor, which means more billing on your part as the outsourced billing partner of that doctor. That gives more profits to you as a billing company. It frees up more time for the doctor, and that leads to him seeing more patients. You see? Exactly. It's a wonderful circle of life. <laughs> All right, let's talk about how Obamacare positions you for success uh, in your own medical billing business. Uh, Eric, I think you found this, uh, this website out there that talks about uh, medical billing and coding industry predicted to boom. Yeah, yeah, we actually showed this one uh, a few months ago. But folks, I mean, if you can see here, uh, all we're seeing are increases of, of, of uh, what's going to happen in this particular industry. I mean, 21% by the year 2020. Uh, I think last week, Patrick and I showed you some uh, uh, charts showing um, the difference between growth in professional careers versus careers that are in the medical billing field. And we're talking about a 14% increase over even that. So, you know, all we're seeing here are increases about what people can get into. And that's one of the things that we kind of discussed last week. Is this a good business is this a good sector to be in? Folks, when you're thinking about getting into any business, you really need to kind of look where the money's going and what the what the projections are. Yeah, and, and when we're talking about a boom here, look, uh, one way you can know that this is a growth industry, folks, is just to look at the charts uh, from all of the insurance companies out there, the ones that pay the claims to the doctors. Uh, this, is the, this is a growth chart here, as you can see. Let me move something out of my way here on my screen. Uh, that shows, uh, this is back in 2009, 2011, 10, 11, 12, and 13 through July of last year. Look at this upward growth for Blue Cross Blue Shield, folks. That's happening right here smack dab in the middle of Obamacare right. being instituted, which means it's a growth industry for them. Look, here's another one, United Healthcare. You see the, you see the trend? It's going up, isn't it? Look at, look at this one. Here's Aetna. It's from down low to up high. In any industry, folks, when you're looking at getting into any industry, shouldn't the charts be going this direction upwards? Here's Humana. Here's Cigna. You see? It's a, it's a common picture. I thought this was a very telling picture for people who are worried about Obamacare. The health insurance companies certainly don't, they're not worried about it, are they? No, no. Their stocks are going up. Right. And, and, and then again, uh, I believe, if I know where you're going with this, what, what about the single-payer system, Patrick? I mean, really, seriously, everybody's so concerned. But I think 
by what you just showed with these graphs, it's going to be hard to shift from Aetna, United Healthcare, and uh, all the others that are at Cigna. You know, for those big companies not to make any money anymore, and then we move to a single payer system. I think that's it's almost unfathomable that can happen. Well, but I let's people, discuss that it's about the whole single payer system. I, I tell people, look, look at the uh, the biggest, tallest buildings, the most expensive buildings downtown in your city. Those are all owned by insurance companies. Right. They are a huge industry in the United States. And health insurance is always going to be around in some form. But first, let me define uh, single-payer health care. Here it is from Wikipedia. It is a system in which the government, uh, rather than the uh, – got something in my way here – rather than private insurers pay for all health care costs. Now, that's already happened, right? If the government wanted to get involved in medical billing in the United States – on the billing side now, they would have done that in 1965. You know what happened in 1965? Lyndon Johnson. The sign of Medicare care. That's right. Medicare was instituted. So folks, here's, here's the bottom line is this. It doesn't matter if the government took this whole thing over or not, because if they did, uh, they could have taken over the billing side back in 1965, because that is universal health care for, right. for people that are 65 and older. And by the way, Eric, I just ran across it. I should have put this in the slides. 10,000 of the baby boomers, they're called, are retiring, turning 65, and getting into the Medicare system. 10,000 per day. Wow. Yeah. So you add that to the 30 million uninsured Americans out there, and it means the doctors are going to be overwhelmed. Well, let's but, not forget that we do have the power to vote. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? I, I don't think that you want your government involved with the billing aspect of anything. <laughs> Doesn't that sound kind of kind of like the fox in the hen house? Uh, exactly. Okay, so. <laughs> we're the government. We're going to pay the doctor, and yet we're going to bill ourselves. No, that's not going to happen. But we did do a little googling. You did this one, I we think, did. Eric, and took a yeah, screenshot. Yeah, we sure of it. did. We we talked about because there were we had so many people worried about go, getting into the single payer. We thought about well. We do know a country that's a single payer right now, and that's Canada. And right. we found out. We did a Google search. We did. You can see up there in the in the Google Canada plus medical billing services. And we did. We ran across the CBM and medical billing services. It, it's it's amazing. They but they even though it's a single payer, uh, the government is still not doing the billing. They, the doctors still have to coordinate with either in their office or with a medical billing company to actually process those claims. Yeah, this is just one of dozens of uh, links that came up there in Google uh, when you look for medical billing services in Canada. And you, you can see right there on the screen, it's in Ontario, this particular one is. But folks, look, we went to their side here as to who they are paying, some of the services that they specialize in. And you think it's just, a, oh, it's just the Canadian government, right? They pay everything. No, look at this. What is that? Uh, uh, at least 10 different entities that have to be billed for the doctors in Canada. So even right. if the United States moved to that kind of system, folks, somebody still got to do the billing. Exactly. Yeah. And they've got a, a college up there in Canada to teach you how to do medical billing. And right. so, you know, we, we, we even hear, we get asked so many times, do I need to go take a medical billing course? Well, you don't, but you could, and if you even wanted to move to Canada and do medical billing in Canada, you can take a course for theirs up there as well. So Sure. It's it's a huge industry up there just like it is here, even though they're right. single payer or called single payer. Uh, look, this is from the Canadian Medical Association, similar to the American Medical Association. And th this is their new practice guide for 2012. I just snapped a picture of the website there uh, a few months back. And as you can see, there's a whole thing on medical billing. I'll zoom in here where you can see that. Uh, throughout your residency, this is talking to doctors, of course, you're taught to consider your patients first as your number one priority. Your working conditions as a resident have been negotiated for you and your salary is stable and consistent, allowing you to focus on perfecting your skills and knowledge without worrying about billing. But once you finish residency and start your own practice, you'll be faced with a new situation. Now they've got to be responsible for the billing, you see, right. and they've got to get their staff involved in that or, and many of them do, uh, outsource it to somebody else who does it for them. Exactly, and I think even in that same website, they talk about what to do if you want to, if you're if you're going to have an outsource, what to look for with an outsource billing company. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, and then uh, I ran across this website, Healthcare Communication News, that talked about the 10 healthcare jobs most impacted by the Affordable Care Act. Well, here's what they say. Medical records and billing is one of the key ones that are affected. Healthcare support industries, especially the medical records and billing companies, stand to greatly benefit from the ACA as potentially 30 million new patients will need healthcare services. They'll need someone to keep track of all their medical records and billing. Uh, in, in other words, it's just exactly what we said. So mm -hmm. exactly. Huge, huge, huge industry. Huge uh, so, industry. So the bottom line is this government does not want to get involved in billing for doctors or they would have back in 1965. And even if we eventually have a single payer system, doctors will still need to get paid. So I like to say it like this, someone, We'll have to bill someone for the doctor to get reimbursed. Now that someone could be the doctor and his staff, but as you'll see, if you come through our training folks, you will be able to cut the costs that a doctor spends inside of his own office in half or more. And you'll be able to get more money for the doctor quicker than they're getting now. So it's a win-win for everybody. And you're asking a question here, is there a need for third party billers? Before you let's before we get to that particular question, let me ask one here from Irene. Irene's asking a question about the codes, which kind of has to something to do with third party billings and uh, medical billing companies and owners. She says, as far as the new codes, Patrick, will the doctor's office not have the same access to the same codes as medical billing owners, business owners? Depends on their software. Depends on their it system does. that they're using. Yeah. We know systems out there right now that would not have been ready this October. Correct. Had the new code's been instituted. They were saying that they were going to have to, you know, have people switch to a different system. Can you imagine the headache of having to do that? So, no, medical coders or people within the doctor's office could have access to a, a list of the codes, but that doesn't mean that they're applying the correct codes. Our system actually suggests the codes. I think we've got a slide showing that here just a little bit later too, Eric. Yeah, and, and so Evelyn, watch this slide when we come up here because Evelyn's asking the question, so are the ICD codes built into your system? And so yes, they are, and you'll see that. You don't have to learn those new codes. Actually, the doctors don't even have to learn new codes because again, uh, it will help code for the doctor. And really, Evelyn, in our system, that transition has already occurred. So, yeah. All right, we, let's keep going. Yeah. Uh, Got lots just, more information. Let me just make that point, Eric. Our system is ready today. today. It all already has all the ICD-10 codes in our system right now. And doctors who were uh, using our system were not even worried about October, even this October. They weren't worried about that because it's already built in there. Exactly. Okay. So is there a need for third party billers? I had to show this because first of all, <laughs> this was a great article, even though it was back last year, says that physicians spend 83,000 a year. Here's a zoom in on the actual quote. They're spending $83,000 a year on administration costs, folks. That's the billing side of the practice. In other words, there are doctors out there who spend much more than they will be paying you to do that. Eric, our average uh, licensee for an average typical general practitioner makes what, maybe $30,000, $35,000 a year? Correct. Uh, right. So 83000 is just, it's, it's ridiculous. Okay, and I also have a quote here from Medical Economics Magazine, and I'll zoom in on that quote as well. At no time in medical history, oh, I love this one. You, you'd think that you wrote this, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> At no time in medical history has there been a greater need for expertise, technology, compliance assistance, et cetera. There's simply no entity in existence positioned to meet these needs better than the third party medical billing companies. Don't you love that? I do. Folks, so that's, folks that's what we teach you to do. You're, exactly. you become that third party medical billing company. So folks, take down that web, web address, that's medicaleconomics.com. And that was a uh, magazine article, I believe it was dated just at the end of last year or something like that. But uh, yes. then it goes on. Uh, this this whole article just continues. April of last year. So one, one year ago is when I said that. Yeah, yep, April of last year. So just over a year ago. Uh, yeah. By leveraging the, the essential functionalities with the potential value adds referred to above, the third-party medical billing industry cannot only be an essential cog, but can also ensure that the Medicare healthcare providers have the time and resources to concentrate on their real priority. Patrick, it's like you read that earlier, uh, said that on, 
providing health care to our aging population. That's right. Yep. Okay, uh, Eric, you keep an eye on the questions. I'm going to move right along here. It's 3.39, so we got plenty of time for questions, and we'll just address all of them we can. There you go. All right, so uh, go ahead and take this one. Uh, go ahead and do the HBMA update, and then I'm going to look at these questions that have come in. All right, this is the Healthcare Billing and Management Association, HBMA, uh, which we're members of, by the way, because they have a voice uh, for billing companies in Washington. They speak for the industry, and they come out with an update every once in a while. This one was last summer, and I've got this one on here because I wanted to show you what they came up with. They actually visit with CMS, and they're about to do that again this year. Uh, they make a visit with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and speak with people there. Well, one of the persons that you can see in the article there, if you look real closely, is John Bloom, Principal Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Medicare. Look, I've got the highlighted part here zoomed out so you can read it. He says, perhaps most significant was a statement by Mr. Bloom made early in his response, indicating that he felt that despite all of the push for coordinated care and bundled payments and shared savings, fee for service payments would be around for a long time. Folks, that should lay to rest any concerns you have. This is from the government agency that handles Medicare, and they say that fee for service payments that is exactly what we're talking about. You bill uh, for the services, uh, the fees for the services for the doctors to Medicare. That'll be around for a long time to come. There you go. And the great thing is that uh, electronic health records is coming down the pike, isn't it, Eric? Absolutely. And it's already here. And it's been in use for quite some time. Uh, matter of fact, again, our system is native. That's pretty, that's pretty interesting to understand. It's native to the iPad, which means it fits. It doesn't go outside the boundaries of, of the iPad or anything else. It was actually built uh, from an iPad simulator uh, way back before the iPad was even created. So Yeah, doctors um, love that. They love this device because they can hold that in their hand, look right in the eyes of the patient, tap a few buttons like you see there in the illustration there. They're, they're big buttons made for a adult hand to touch. And all they do is they're touching buttons and interacting with the patient. And they love that. Now, I've had doctors bring in a laptop and do something similar. But because they have to set it on a desk, they usually turn their back to me. And they're back here typing me, asking me questions. And it's just not the same as right. using something that, that's like this. And plus, it's wireless. This is completely wireless, of course. Yeah, and as Patrick says, it's essential for the ACA, for the Affordable Care Act. Right, and this is a screenshot of it here, folks, along with a brochure that we have that our licensees use to market the EMRX. This is the system, by the way, that we, our staff here at our office, does live demos using a go-to meeting, similar to what you're seeing here on this webinar. We're connecting with the doctor's office right across the internet, live, and showing him or her our system and answering all the questions for you. Uh, I don't think it gets any better than that, Eric, does it? No, and, and, and I tell you, that's, we, we do these demos uh, very frequently. And folks, if you want to see a demo of our system, feel free to ask any of us here. We'll be happy to, to, to step you through it so you see it. I think that's what really brings the connectivity between what you're getting into, whether it's, it's a figment of our imagination or not, this really brings it home to understand what, what you're able to do. Yeah, here's a question from uh, Rosemary that's interesting. I, we don't get this question very often, but she says, does the territory matter? Uh, what if I'm based in Texas? Can I have a medical billing coming out from Maryland? Yes, Rosemary. Unlike franchises, which do restrict you to a certain territory, this is not a franchise. It's a licensing situation, which means we license our software systems and all of our other systems, our marketing systems and so forth, to you as a business owner. You're in business for yourself. You start your own business. You name your own business. And you can go out and build this as big as you wish. Yeah. Um, that Benjamin Ishkahoff that I showed you earlier on one of the slides, he's built his business nationwide. Why? Because if he does a good job for a doctor right there in his area, and that doctor knows a doctor in another state and refers that doctor, we don't want to restrict you from that. 
So yes, the answer is yes, you can do business anywhere in the United States, including, uh, well, all, all 50 states. Yeah, let's continue on, Patrick. We've got just about 15 more minutes that we need to get through, and I know you've got some more information you want to get to. And we'll again, we'll take care of much of this uh, uh, these questions as we can towards the end here. All right. Uh, beginning this year, folks, the ACA will increase the need for medical billing experts. Now, you'll notice that I'm not just saying these things. It's not just me and Eric saying these things because uh, we could say anything, right? We own the company, but it's from experts that are telling us these things. Look, here is a website called BillingSolutions.com, and it says specifically that uh, bill medical billing would change drastically in that insurance companies will be paying all or the bulk of the bill without individuals being responsible for payment. There'll be an increase in the need for medical billing experts to handle the workload of more forms, more coding, et cetera. And this also means more revenue for primary care doctors internists, pediatricians, and geriatric physicians. So all it's saying, folks, is this. There's a huge future in this. The ACA is going to bring about an increase in the need for medical billing experts, and we can train you to be that expert. Uh, Harold Gibson says, uh, back in September, payers also face new operating rules for claims processing, including eligibility determination which could further burden the billing staff and practice managers. He's talking about doctors who do a billing in their own office. Critics believe the new rules will only increase the expense and confusion that result in billing errors and force claims resubmission. Eric, that's a big problem in a doctor's office, isn't it? Allocating the correct number of people with the correct expertise. When they outsource their billing to a medical billing company, that billing company is doing billing not just for that doctor's office, but for maybe a dozen offices, right? Right. So folks, you have behind you the nation's largest network of independent medical billing companies. We are the nation's largest network. And so when you go in and position yourself as a part of our network, it's like saying you just opened an office for Century 21 to sell homes. So it's a, it's a great situation for our licensees because they position themselves the right way and have all of our expertise, our 20 years experience, our over 100 people on our support staff with all of our technology partners helping you to be successful in the business. Uh, let's see, I think, oh yeah. And of course, we've mentioned the ICD-10 codes <coughs> coming in October of next year. Right. Now, the reason I'm showing this screenshot of our system is because it specifically shows the diagnosis codes that are in our system. And as you can see, we have a button there for the doctors to push to see the ICD-9, that's the current codes, and the ICD-10 codes that are coming, and they're all there. Yeah, and, and that's, I wanted to uh, address a, a question here concerning the EMR, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about electronic medical records here. Larry's asking the question, there are so many offices, doctor's offices already out there that have an EHR system or electronic health system, or an electronic medical record system. So those are pretty in exchange, exchangeable there on those uh, terms. So why, again, would a doctor's office change? Well, certainly, Larry, one of the reasons why is because not only do we have the ICD-9 codes there and the ICD-10 codes there, what I think we can demonstrate for you is showing you if we can take you through a demonstration of what a doctor actually goes through when they're seeing a patient. Um, you can just think about it yourself. When you go to see the doctor, they're asking you, why are you coming in? They do what's called their subjective questions. They're doing their discovery. Then they go through their objective where they start to look and investigate and they do their physical exam. When they chart that through this our EMR system, you'll see it's highlighted there where it says diagnosis code. Right underneath diagnosis code, it says suggested. What the system does, Larry, it actually charts and, and provides the diagnosis codes for that particular visit. And when we demonstrate this to doctors, this is why doctors are moving from other EMR systems to our EMR system because they're not having to guess as to whether it's a pharyngitis or it's a laryngitis or whatever it might be. The system's actually pro processing that for them. And so um, that's why, 
again, Larry, we're seeing so many doctors change over. Plus, it's it's Patrick. I don't know if you knew about this, but I just got the update that with the new Siri, you know, that's the part about the Apple Apple iPad portion of it. Yeah. Um, that now instead of the doctors having to use the dragon speak medical terms added into there, the new Siri is now picking up nearly 98% of all med medicines yeah. and medical codes whenever the doctors can just literally speak in time on, on that. So Patrick, just point real quickly where it says Grand Central and right underneath there it shows notes. The, 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 the doctor can can instead of transcribing their notes uh, or recording their notes so, so somebody else can transcribe those at a later date, they can literally do that right in here and they once they're done with this particular visit, Larry, or anybody else listening, this that note is done. Right. It's 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 just incredible what this system can do. Yeah, the technology that's available through uh, smart tablets and uh, like the iPad is just incredible. It, it used to doctors would have to go back and either tap up the notes or record them, usually into a little recorder, and send right. that tape to somebody who was a transcriptionist, and they would right. listen to the tape. Uh, and type up the notes. Now the doctor taps on that little field right there, a keyboard pops up, and alongside the keyboard is a little microphone. They tap the microphone on the iPad and start talking. And the, and when they get through and tap it again, the notes are transcribed for them right into this field here. You'd have to see it to, to really grasp how cool that really is. But Yeah, uh, I mean, the doctor could literally say, hey, uh, this person has pharyngitis. I'm gonna prescribe them uh, Zithromax at whatever and it just it just populates all that and they're not even having to type it so yeah. as quick as they're, they're as they're speaking is as quick as it'll it'll type it out for the doctor so so to kind of address larry's real concern here i think is he thinks well uh, the doctors already have an er or ahr system so why would they switch because there is a cost of course in switching but the difference is this our system can get so much more money for the doctor by giving him the accurate codes that he should be using right. That's where a lot of doctors are leaving money on the table. And there are, th well, Eric, we just saw a demonstration yesterday of a system that actually goes in and looks at money that's already been billed, but has errors in it. And there were, right. what, $9 million for one particular medical organization. Yes. And, and, cra and it's crazy what money is being lost by doctors. So, Larry, yes. they switch because we show them how they can get more money. And we've seen doctors who've spent forty, fifty thousand dollars on EHR systems switch over to ours. Now, the second part of Larry's question there is: if an office is using another system, can they still be using your billing system? Yes, there are ways to tie systems together out there because they've come up with a standardization language for EHR systems and billing systems called HL7, Health Level Seven, is what that stands for. And all that means is it's a standard programming language that if that system is an HL7, which most of them are, and ours is, then yes, they can be programmed to talk together. Now, there's a cost for that, uh, but again, minimal compared to what the doctor would lose by staying with his own yeah. system. Exactly, exactly. Good question, though, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we've got about eight more minutes here, Patrick, so we can go through as much as we can get in here for the rest of the hour here. Yes, so Evelyn, yes, <laughs> this is a voice... Oh recognition transcribing system. That's right. <laughs> That's correct, Evelyn. Absolutely. Uh, hey, I'm just showing this article that I wrote uh, a few months back for the uh, Billing and Coding Advantage magazine. I'm on the editorial board, so I submit articles each month, actually every other month, for this magazine. This is a print magazine, folks, that uh, is, is big out there in the billing and coding industry. And as you can see, I wrote an article called How the Affordable Care Act Will Help Your Billing Business Thrive. So if right. you'd like a copy of that article, it's about, I don't know, three or four pages. Ask your ABS representative, the one that sent you the email for this webinar. Just get back and ask for a copy of this article or just call us. So we'll show the number here in just a second. You can just call us for that. Well, there it is right there. There we go. Yeah, folks, if you want to, just give us a call here at 866-565-8413. Uh, and give us a call. And again, uh, you know, we certainly don't ever want to feel like we're, we're forcing anybody or trying to get you here too quickly. 
but if you do know that you want to try to make a, uh, a push to get here and you want to get into the next week's class, I think we do have a few more seats we could certainly fill, so you can certainly get with us. Uh, but mark down your calendars for the July. And it's, it's amazing that we're even talking about July, Patrick. It's just, didn't, didn't we just start this year? <laughs> it just seemed like we I, just I celebrated Christmas and the New Year. <laughs> and here we I are know. about to celebrate July the 4th. So, uh, folks, give us a call here. We'll certainly love to have you here. Yeah, now, by the way, as you can see uh, illustrated here in this uh, picture of one of our classes, uh, it is. There are fairly small classes. They're anywhere from usually 12 to 18, 20 people at the most. And uh, we do bring in uh, a licensee who is has already for five years built a very successful medical billing business. Uh, she comes in. You can see her there in that picture. That, that's Cynthia Anderson. She teaches the class along with Eric and myself. Uh, and we have some guests that show up from time to time. The point is, folks, that this is a very intimate situation where we're hand-holding you. This is not <laughs> what was the terms uh, one of the uh, folks we used last year, uh, last last training? Rah rah. This is not a rah rah session. Right. <laughs> he said, "Look, I don't want any rah rah here. I'm already sold. What I need now is the tools to build my business. And there's no rah rah, is there, Eric? We don't get up no, on the chairs. We don't uh, dance. We don't uh, turn down the lights and uh, sing kumbaya. This is a very <laughs> focused, business oriented situation, folks, and it's very very detailed." You'll be surprised at what you can learn in five days. Now, is it everything you need to know about this business? No, it, th there's lots to learn about this business. That's why after the training session here in Dallas, you'll be able to have access to our private licensee website where there are probably another 35 to 40 hours of training uh, in addition to this 35 to 40 hours of training uh, during this week here. So lots to learn but we give you enough to get you started. And uh, hey, we've had people go out the next week and get clients from this class, so. Uh, yeah, what, yeah what, let's, let's talk about that real quick. We've got just a couple more minutes here. What, what do you expect to get out of this class after the five days? You, what you have is enough information to go out there and market and go find your first client. Once you've got your client and once you've got your doctor, we're here to help handhold you all the way through the process whether it's the implementation part of it or filing your first claim. We truly are here. We've got step-by-step -step videos. We're here uh, so you don't feel alone that if you want someone to kind of demonstrate that for you, we'll even do that for you. So I think, Patrick, what I wanted to do was to help people feel comfortable enough to know that uh, just because you go through that five days of training and then we say, oh, well, we've got this website you can go to and learn all this, Folks, that's just not all of it. We're, we're really here. We're here to help you. I do some of the demos. Patrick does a lot of mentoring, helps you. We've got Casey who actually helps with the proposals and the, all the strategies that are out there. We're here to help you. Yeah, and it's because of the way we built our company, folks, just so you know, after your initial licensing fee that you pay to get into our workshop, uh, there is not a penny that you will ever pay to ABS ever again. Uh, we honestly have lifetime support for our licensees. That's why we do regular webinars on a regular basis for our licensees, like this one, but specifically on different topics for people who've invested and gone through our training. We have one coming up this Friday, for example, where we go over our new agreement that we just developed, step by wow. step, paragraph by paragraph, to teach you exactly what all needs to be in your contracts. We had one on pricing, proposals, Folks, we go and continually train our licensees because we do make some money. That is, when you sign up clients on our services, we've made agreements with our technology partners so that they actually pay us a few pennies on each transaction on the back end. Now, that's a good thing if you think about it. It's not that you're paying those fees. You wouldn't even know about them unless I had just told you about them, right? Those come from our technology partners because we bring them such huge volume of business you do as licensees. And so we make money. Isn't that a good thing? Because now we have a kind of a vested interest in your success, don't we? We right. want you to be successful. We want you to sign up more clients and process more claims because as a company, we make more money on the back end as well. Anyway. There you go. All right. So let me just talk for a second about our guarantee, Eric, because sure. I remember uh, this has been what, maybe three or four years ago that we came up with this. I did. 
Because at one time we had a guarantee and it basically said, you know, if you don't like what you see after the first day and a half, ask for your money back and go home. Well, I decided at one point, look, until somebody has set through that entire week of training, they really don't know all of the proprietary secrets that we share. They don't know right. all the marketing tips and tricks that we know that we've learned over 20 years. Uh, they couldn't possibly know what the business is really all about unless they went through the whole week. So I just came up with a guarantee that's, uh, well, I don't know of any other company that has anything like it. Do you, Eric? It's no. Unique. It just says, basically, if the end of the training workshop, uh, and this is in our agreement that you'll sign with us, folks, word for word, for any reason, if you don't think this business is right for you, just simply tell any staff member and they'll arrange for you to receive a full refund of your license fee. That's every penny that you pay to us. Now, will you be out some money? Of course, you're out the week that you were here. Uh, you know, whatever travel cost you had and the hotel is about $700 for the week. So there's a little investment there, maybe with travel, what, $1,000, 10, 11, $1,200. Folks, that's a cheap investment to find out if this is for real. Look, if Eric and I are telling you the truth, you'll know that by the end of this week. If we yeah, weren't telling you the truth, you'll know that by the end of this week. And right. either way, uh, we'll part as friends. There you go. So, folks, give us a call here, again, at 866-565-8413. Now, remember, if you haven't got that, if you, if you haven't received it in the past, that magazine article that Patrick was talking about, uh, on the Affordable Care Act, the one that he wrote for BC Advantage, uh, give us a call. Check it and check out with one of us. We'll certainly get you a copy of that. Mm -hmm.